Are you looking for ways to strengthen your marriage? Would you like to raise children you enjoy being around? Do you long for a peaceful, orderly home that's a blessing to everyone who comes through its doors? Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jennifer Flanders, a Bible-believing, homeschooling mother to 12, and host of the Loving Life at Home podcast. Join me as we discover what God's Word has to say about marriage, motherhood, and minding the things that matter most. Hello, friend. Thanks so much for joining me for this week's episode of Loving Life at Home. Today on the show, we're talking about babies and why, contrary to the narrative our modern culture keeps pushing, having babies is actually a very smart thing to do. Recently, I saw a reel on Instagram where a woman was sitting at a table and you could see a hand extending an engagement ring to her. But every time she went to slip her finger into the ring, she had a vision of what her life was going to be like. And it was filled with drudgery and uh, comforting, crying babies and scrubbing floors and doing laundry. And she decided she wanted no part of that. So she ended up setting that ring on the table and saying, no, thank you, and, and going away, which is how some people view both marriage and motherhood. We talked a little bit about marriage last week in our episode about girl power, and I told you then that we would come back this week and talk about motherhood, and so that's what we're going to do. I also talked a little bit about Barbie last week, the Barbie movie, and one of the most disturbing scenes in that movie is the opening scene. I realized it was a send up to Space Odyssey. It was uh, used the same music, the same imagery, but it was still really disturbing to see all these sweet little girls just throwing their baby dolls to the ground and bashing their heads on the ground. I mean, uh, they were little China dolls and their heads were just getting broken to bits the way the bones and Space Odyssey got broken to bits when the apes were doing doing the same thing with the bones. But the message was clear. You know, the big Barbie descended and they looked at their baby dolls and thought, no, thank you. I'm better off without that. And they bashed them to the ground and gave it no further thought. And so uh, when you get to Barbie land, there are no babies. That was really sad to me. Unless you count the one, and, and you should, there was one in utero baby. There was a pregnant Barbie, but everybody treated her like she had the plague. They would wince when they saw her. Even that part was very disturbing. But there were no married uh, couples that were very obvious. There were no, I guess the pregnant Barbie maybe had a husband, but there were no marriages and no children. So I cringe to think that that is our future, but so many people are electing to forego marriage. And even the couples that do decide to get married more and more are deciding not to have children, volitionally deciding that. There was once a time when societies viewed children as what uh, the way God viewed them, uh, as a rich blessing and a heritage, as a gift, a reward. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. That's a passage that carried a lot of power back when I was growing up. We, we viewed children as a blessing, and that's not always the case these days. Whereas earlier they were seen as an integral and valuable part of the family, having babies was a natural progression after getting married, not some distant afterthought. Uh, a large family was considered an asset, not a liability. You know, families my size with 12 children, that was pretty commonplace 100 years ago, but not so anymore. Times have changed. Fertility rates in the United States shortly before COVID reached a 42-year low. Although the news reports that heralded that bleak statistic were talking about fertility rates, what they're really describing is not our fertility rate, but our birth rate. Because the problem is not so much that we're unable to conceive, but that as a nation, we're choosing not to conceive. Or up until they reverse Roe v. Wade, electing to terminate a large percentage of the pregnancies that did occur. Consequently, for nearly every group of women of reproductive age, U.S. birth rates 
have plummeted. I think it's starting to come up a little bit now, but that steep decline has resulted in the fewest newborns our country has seen since 1977. Again, this was just shortly before COVID. When we notice those kind of trends, it's smart to ask, why? Why is this? Why aren't people having babies? Why aren't children loved and valued and protected in our society the way they should be? We live in a culture that views its offspring as a burden and as an inconvenience. And in past generations, getting married and settled down and raising a family were considered markers of successful transition into adulthood, Markers that the vast majority of young people achieved by the time they turned 30, but that's no longer the case. These days, young adults rarely consider themselves ready for that kind of responsibility. They don't want to rush into anything that they might later regret. In their minds, the risks far outweigh the benefits. And if they're unwilling to commit to marriage, which society now views as transient and disposable, if not archaic and completely unnecessary, how much more are they disinclined to become parents, to shoulder the lifelong attachment and responsibility of parenthood? Unfortunately, even couples who overcome their risk aversion sufficiently to get married uh, are still pausing at the prospect of starting a family. Uh, My husband and I, as I've mentioned before, uh, got married while we were both still students. He was 20. I was 22. He was juggling three jobs at that time and attending night school to finish his bachelor's degree. I was teaching calculus while working on my master's degree in math. And we lived in this cheap little apartment complex that was populated by topless dancers and suspected drug dealers and impoverished neighbors who were under constant threat of eviction. Those little topless dancers would come to my house for Bible studies. I taught them how to do needlework, and we would open the Word of God together, and our children would play together, and then they'd look at their watch and say, oh, it's time for me to run to work. And so sadly, they would take their children and leave and then sell themselves cheap at the topless bar down the street. But that's another story for another day. The point is that the standard advice that our parents and our premarital counselors both and really just about everybody offered was to wait five years minimum before starting a family. First, they thought that we needed to get to know one another, to finish our degrees, buy a house, or at least move to a safer, more child-friendly neighborhood. All well-meaning recommendations, to be sure, but advice that, by the gracious providence of God, we immediately and happily ignored by getting pregnant two weeks into our honeymoon. So, more children followed in quick succession, and I spent 25 years of my life either pregnant or nursing or both, and now 12 children and 20 grandchildren later, we feel supremely blessed. So, it saddens me to to see married couples postponing children indefinitely or even willfully choosing to remain childless for life. A lot of people seem to think that that is the enlightened view and that if you're pro having family and especially a big family, that you must be unenlightened or not smart enough to figure out birth control or ignorant of how sex actually works. How many times have I been asked, don't you know what causes that when they count? And they started making those statements, not when I had 10 and 11 and 12 children, but when I had the third, by the third child, I was already hearing, don't you know what causes that? The implication being that if I knew, then I would have prevented it from happening, which is just so sad to me, but um, but that's how it is. And even a few years back, I don't know if you remember this, but the French president at the time, Emmanuel Macron, made a statement. He said basically that he could not imagine a woman who was perfectly educated ever choosing to have seven, eight, or nine children. The implication was that no woman in her right mind would choose to have so many kids. I don't believe that he was intentionally trying to slight smart mothers or large families. I just think he was, like many people today, prejudiced and ill-informed. Presiding as he did at the time over a first world country where the average household size was only 2.3, that's mom, dad, and 0.3 children 
or maybe a single mom and 1.3 children. Macron may have assumed that families with upwards of four or five times that many members were backward or somehow benighted, but that is simply untrue. And his statements started a response on Instagram under the hashtag postcards for Macron. And uh, he learned very quickly that many highly educated women with mega-sized families do exist. And I'm one of those. Those Instagram posts beautifully demonstrated an important point. Many smart women consciously choose to have a lot of children. And I'd like to take that conversation today one step further and show that having a lot of children is actually one of the best and smartest choices that a woman can make. I've written on my blog, and I'll link it in the show notes, a post about the unexpected blessings of having a large family. And by those kind of blessings, I mean mean just the perks of having a big family that have been meaningful to me personally. But today I want to discuss the scientific advantages to having any children at all, but especially a lot of children. So there are nine science-backed benefits to birthing a big family that I want to discuss today. And I created an infographic to provide a visual summary of what I'm about to share with you. And I'll link that in the show notes as well. But for now, let's dig in. When the Bible tells us that children are a blessing and the fruit of the womb is a reward, you better believe that God has packed a lot more meaning into those words than we can even fathom. And the more I have looked into it, the more in awe I am of His design and how all of these things work together for our blessing and our benefit when we choose to agree with him that children are a blessing. So number one is cellular rejuvenation. We all know that when you're pregnant, a woman's body changes in significant ways each time she carries a baby, Uh, not the least of which is her bulging belly. But did you also know that thanks to a process known as microchimerism, being pregnant actually leads to the repair of damaged tissues in a mother's body at a cellular level. A woman's body harbors residual fetal cells from her children long after she's given birth, which is just amazing. And they can tell it's fetal cells from the child because it does not share her own DNA. They found male DNA circulating in the bodies of mothers of sons, even decades later, providing myriad health benefits to the host. It's almost like getting a full body makeover from the inside out. So So that is something that they don't understand completely, but it is certainly an amazing benefit of having babies. Then the second benefit I want to talk about is mental acuity. Did you know that birthing lots of babies has been linked with lower maternal incident of dementia? While the relationship may not be causal in nature, studies suggest that women who spend more of their lives pregnant are less likely to develop Alzheimer's. Researchers have noticed a 5.5% decrease in risk to mothers per pregnancy, which is awesome, and I'm so thankful for that. Then uh, third, marital stability. Having a large family is protective of your marriage. Now, that's not to say that your marriage is doomed if you have one or two kids, and it certainly also not to say that there aren't large marriages that have ended in divorce. But statistically speaking, the greater the number of children that you have, the lower your risk for divorce. Not only is the presence of young children in the home one of the strongest predictors of marital stability, but sociologists tell us that the older a couple is when their last child leaves home, when their nest is empty, the better the chance that their marriage is going to survive. So a empty nester that becomes an empty nester at age 60 is going to have a little bit easier time sticking together than an empty nester whose child left at 40. So again, it's not a given, but there is a statistically significant advantage to having a big family. Then the fourth thing I want to talk about is breast health. You know, hormonal contraceptive use and abortion both increase a woman's chance of breast cancer. But having babies and breastfeeding those babies lowers the incidence of breast cancer significantly. Researchers report that for every year that a woman spends breastfeeding, her risk of breast cancer drops by 4.3%. 
that after having nursed a dozen babies for nearly two years each, then my own chance of getting breast cancer is virtually non-existent. That doesn't mean it can't happen, and I would be wise to keep a check on that, especially since I have some family incidents of breast cancer. But statistically speaking, my incidence is pretty low thanks to all the babies I've had and all the years I've spent breastfeeding. Then the fifth blessing from having children is cancer prevention. In addition to decreased incidence of breast cancer, studies have also shown that women who breastfeed multiple children for a combined total of 31 months or more reduce their risk of ovarian cancer by 91%. Pregnancy itself is also protective. Research suggests that women who give birth to 10 or more children enjoy a reduced risk of ovarian and endometrial cancers as well. And then the sixth scientific benefit of having babies is deceleration of aging. The number of children a woman bears slows down the rate at which her body ages. According to researchers, the more surviving children she births, the longer her telomeres, which are the protective end caps on DNA strands that are associated with aging, they get shorter as you get older. But the more children you have, the longer those stay for the longer period of time. Whether or not her apparent age is affected, bearing children does benefit a mother's biological age. But oftentimes it benefits her apparent age too. We've all seen these pictures of mega families where it's hard to determine who the mother is because she looks as young as a lot of her daughters do. So there's that as well. Then the seventh scientific blessing of having a big family is delayed menopause. Both pregnancy and breastfeeding can prevent ovulation, leading to a greater stock of follicles later in life and affecting the timing of menopause. I myself, I'm 58 now. I just finally went through menopause last year at 57 years old. That's because for those 12 pregnancies and uh, one to two years of nursing each baby, most of that time I didn't have a cycle. So a woman is born with all the eggs she'll ever have, and those get used up every month as you have a cycle. But you know, you delay those cycles for extended periods of time due to pregnancy and breastfeeding, and it delays the onset of menopause as well. So that's great. I'm just now having to deal with, uh, I haven't had a lot of hot flashes. I'm pretty cold natured as it is, but I certainly have had that menopausal weight gain in the last year, and I'm going to have to figure out something to do about that. But the point is, the more pregnancies a woman sustains and the more babies she breastfeeds, the longer the onset of menopause and its attendant changes and challenges may be delayed. Then the eighth scientific benefit of having babies is increased longevity. So not only do you look younger, but you live longer. Multiple studies have shown that married women who have three, four, or five or more children enjoy significantly lower mortality rate than those with two or fewer. In other words, having more children is associated with longer life. In no instance was higher parity, which means how how many babies you've had, was higher parity significantly associated with a higher mortality risk. And of course, these studies are being done in the modern era where we have good access to health care and especially antibiotics because a 100 years ago even, pre-antibiotics, one in five women died in childbirth. But that statistic has been greatly reduced by the discovery of penicillin and other antibiotics that can fight infection that comes uh, sometimes after giving birth. And then the ninth benefit that we see is social security. And by that, I mean that decreased fertility and dwindling birth rates pretend deeply troubling problems for societies worldwide, including labor shortages and top-heavy populations and economic collapse. That's why countries like Germany and Austria and Denmark, I think, Sweden, even France, have begun paying couples to procreate. Smart women who choose to have a lot of children are just ahead of that curve. So those are my nine scientific reasons why having children, and especially a lot of them, is a good idea, a smart idea. Unfortunately, these findings are not widely publicized, and so we still have a lot of prejudice statements being made by people that buy into the notion that children are a burden and that only backwards people have more than the standard one or two. 
One of my husband's colleagues thinks that I am absolutely insane for wanting a large family. I mean, he thinks there's something clinically wrong with anybody that would want as many children as I have. But I'm here to challenge that narrative. As for those people that make the comments about us not knowing what causes children or understanding how birth control works or needing a TV or whatever their comment is that they feel so comfortable making to complete strangers, I think In the next episode of Loving Life at Home, we will take a look at how to graciously respond to those people. But in the meantime, if you have children, rejoice over these wonderful findings and understand that those children are even more deeply a blessing than you hitherto realized. And if you don't have children and that is a volitional choice and not a sad state of reality in your mind, then uh, I would encourage you to investigate these matters and understand that children are a blessing in many, many ways that we don't even understand and maybe rethink that decision. Thanks so much for listening today. If you have a question you'd like to hear covered on this podcast, Message me on Instagram at Flanders underscore family or contact me through my website, lovinglifeathome.com. Before you go, if you've been encouraged by something you've heard on the show, do me a favor and forward the link to a friend or head over to Loving Life at Home on Apple iTunes to subscribe and leave a written review of the show. Your doing so will help others find me so they can listen too. Until next time, I pray the Lord will bless your efforts to build a loving home life centered on Him.